Today is going to be an introduction to quantum entanglement. And I would think of this more as an introduction than an explanation because quantum entanglement is one of the most mysterious, most counterintuitive things that exists in our universe. In fact, it's so counterintuitive that no less a genius than Albert Einstein called it spooky, spooky action at a distance. Why is it so counterintuitive? Well, in the world we live in, one thing leads to another. Causes have effects. And objects are either one thing or another. Something is not both here and there, or in one state and another state, alive and dead like Schrodinger's cat. They're either one thing or another in our common experience. Quantum entanglement and quantum mechanics in general challenge all of those assumptions. And so they're really hard for us to wrap our heads around. I think the best way to explain quantum entanglement to a non-physicist and from a non-physicist like me would be with analogies. So I have a few analogies here, and by the time I go through those, you're going to understand some fundamental characteristics of quantum entanglement. You might have heard the analogy of the drive through order. Let's say you and your friend go to Taco Bell. You order a taco and a burrito. You ask for them to be put in separate bags because you know you're going your separate ways. So in one bag is a taco, another is the burrito. Now, since this is the Taco Bell drive through you look in the bag, you confirm there's one taco, one burrito. You give one of the bags to your friend who gets in his car, drives to one side of town. You take the other bag, get in your car, drive to the other side of town. You open your bag, you look inside, lo and behold, you have the taco. You know right then that your friend at his house has the burrito. You don't have to call him on the phone. You don't have to drive to his house. You know right then that he has the burrito. That's because in a sense, your order is entangled. Your order consisted of a taco plus a burrito. And it doesn't matter if you took your burrito and flew at light speed to another solar system, another galaxy, whatever it is, you would know right away that your friend had the burrito. When that order consists of these two things, you can join them into a common formula. They became entangled in a sense. Let's go to another analogy. You've all seen this scenario in movies and cartoons. Somebody wants to get revenge on somebody else or control them in some way. So they make a doll to represent the person they're trying to control or get revenge on. That doll has no power. So you take it to the voodoo practitioner. The voodoo practitioner will then get a toenail, a fingernail, strand of hair, a hat, to charge that voodoo doll up with voodoo power so that when he sticks a pin into the arm of the voodoo doll, the person that it represents feels pain. And in those scenarios, that's instantaneous. You stick the doll, pain erupts. The point of this analogy is, through the power of voodoo, they became entangled. Once they became entangled, what happened to one instantly affected the other. And also for the sake of the analogy, it doesn't really matter if the doll is on Venus and the person who it represents is in the Kuiper belt somewhere. When that pin is stuck into the doll, the person immediately feels pain. It is, according to the common understanding of voodoo, I guess, instantaneous. You've probably heard stories of identical twins where one twin experiences terror and the other twin at that moment feels afraid. One twin experiences a heart attack and their twin wherever they are, miles away, across the continents, will feel a pain in their chest. That whole idea is analogous in some ways to our understanding of entanglement. Because those twins came from a single particle, a single fertilized egg, which then split into two particles. So the one became two, those two particles were entangled, and in theory, they can be entangled throughout the lives of those twins. But I'm not saying that this reference is actually real. I don't know that. I don't know it's not, I don't know what it is. But the idea is similar. One particle becomes two entangled particles. If I were trying to bring this back to quantum entanglement, I would say it like this. Aspects of one of the twins in this entangled pair of twins depends on aspects of the other twin. When two particles are entangled, aspects of one particle depend on aspects of the other particle. And the spookiest thing about entanglement is this. When a pair of particles become entangled, it doesn't matter how great the distance is between them. They remain connected. They could be across the entire universe. They might as well be in the same little matchbox. And it's stranger than that. I won't get into this. They don't even have to be in the same time to be entangled. Entanglement can not only span vast distances of space, 
but it can also reach across time. So let's say you take one photon, pass it through a crystal, and make an entangled pair of photons. You then allow them to move for several years at the speed of light in the opposite direction one from the other. Those remain entangled. Aspects of one particle determine aspects of the other particle, no matter how far they've traveled, no matter how long you've given them to separate from each other. And I will explain what some of those aspects are. But for now, that's really what you have to know about entanglement. Particles become entangled. It doesn't matter the distance between them. Even time can separate them and they remain entangled. This is why Einstein thought it was so spooky. It violates the principle of locality. Locality is one of the hallmarks of classical physics. If I'm in one car, I see another car down the road about to hit somebody. I have to somehow affect that car, try to get it to stop so it doesn't hit the pedestrian. Well, I could drive super, super fast, hit it with my car, and veer it off course so it didn't hit the pedestrian. I could throw a rock. I could honk at it and send a sound wave that would travel to the car and alert it to the fact that it was about to hit a pedestrian. I could flash my lights. That would be about the fastest way for that information to travel because in classic physics, there is no way I could get my car or even any information from one car to another faster than the speed of light. That's it. But that's just not the case with entanglement. Now you might want to stop there. You think, please no more. And you're well within your rights to do that. Because if we go a little deeper, I'm going to have to introduce terms that frankly sound so tedious they're going to make your hair hurt. One of those is the wave function. A wave function is a mathematical formula that describes everything we can know about a particle. So a quantum particle, a very tiny particle, has a momentum, time, position, and spin, all of which are taken into account in its wave function. When two particles become entangled, they can be described by the same wave function. Go back to my analogy about the order. This entire system, this taco and burrito, that system we call the order itself, were described by one formula. Well, two particles, particle A and particle B, can be described by the same wave function when they are entangled. So let's just take the most simple aspect of the wave function, the spin. Let's say that the wave function describes the total spin of this system as zero. There's no spin. Think of it this way. If B has upspin and A has upspin, they don't cancel each other out. There's not a net spin of zero. If A has downspin, B would have to have upspin. If B has downspin, A would have to have upspin. So by knowing something about the spin of B, you will also know right at that moment, instantaneously, something about the spin of A. And when particles are entangled and share the wave function, you could talk about their momentum, time, their position, or their spin. And they are interdependent because they're all part of the same formula. That doesn't matter if they are a billion, two billion light years apart. Now, let me just say this. If that were all it was, that's not that big of a deal. If I get a box of gloves and there's only a right-handed glove, I know that somewhere is the left-handed glove. There's nothing spooky about that. There's nothing spooky about knowing that if I have a taco, my friend has a burrito. What is spooky is this. These particles exist in a state of superposition. Remember, when we talked about Schrodinger's cat, the cat would be in a state of superposition, both alive and dead. Going back to our electrons, B and A would exist in a state of superposition, having both upspin and downspin until they were observed, until something measured their spin. As soon as their spin is measured, the interaction of the measurement with the particle collapses the wave function. It's no longer in a state of both up and down. It becomes either up or down. So just to bring home how crazy this is, if these are on opposite sides of the entire universe, B and A, entangled particles, are existing in their state of superposition, you measure the state of particle B. At that moment, when you measure it, the wave function collapses. It is no longer in a state of superposition all the way across the universe the state of superposition of particle A collapses at that same instant. That's why it's so spooky. That's why it's fundamentally different than our analogy of tacos and burritos. And that's why I say quantum entanglement is one of the most bizarre, one of the most 
counterintuitive ideas in the known universe.